Hello, Edu Magicians. Welcome to the Edu Magic Podcast with your host, Dr. Sam Fesich. Dr. Sam is a professor of education, author of Edu Magic, and a pumpkin spice latte fan. This podcast is designed for pre service teachers. Remember, friends, teaching doesn't begin at graduation, but during that first class at 8 a.m. Let's get this party started. Gretchen Bridgers of the Always a Lessons Empowering Educators podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, Edu Magicians, it's Sam. And before we start into this episode, I want to share with you about an amazing resource. It's called the Educator Candidate Member Portal. AAEE provides you with resources such as virtual job fairs, a job board, interview tips and prep, resume building, webinars. You can even get a copy of the Job Search Handbook digitally. So head on over to aaee.org and create your free Educator Candidate member account today. Friends, one more thing before we get started. This episode is brought to you by my new course, Digital Portfolios from Scratch to Interview Ready. Head on over to sfesage.com slash courses for more information about this self-paced, hands-on virtual workshop. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Edgy Magic Podcast. My name is Dr. Sam Fessage, and today I have with me Sarah Heinzelman. Now, Sarah and I go way back um, to KTI, I think it was 2018, where she was a lead learner, and I learned learned wonderful things from her, but we also are kindred spirits as we are We are both, um, I'm a former special ed teacher, she's a current special ed teacher, and today we're talking all about tips for future special ed teachers. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. So let's talk about your teaching story. What got you into education and what is your current role? Sure. So when I went through my undergraduate program, um, I was really drawn to emotional support and um, found myself in a emotional support room for student teaching, and then took on a position at Centennial School of Lehigh University, which is where I started in an emotional support classroom. And that whole program is a laboratory school. So I worked through their teacher intern program and then went on to be a lead teacher to mentor other teachers. Spent about a little over eight years as a special education teacher, and then moved into my current role of technology integration specialist, still at Centennial School, doing a lot of teacher mentoring and providing technology support in the classroom. That's awesome. I love how you started your journey in Centennial with this passion to help students in emotional support, and now you're the tech tech guru of the school, and you do some mentoring with new teachers. Can you tell me what mentoring with new teachers, what that looks like, and how it might be a little bit different from a traditional public school? Absolutely. So our teachers that come to us are here with us between two and three years, and when they are with us, we do very direct mentoring of giving feedback on lesson plans, providing feedback on writing IEPs. We meet with our teachers daily. We provide direct observations as well. Um, And at the same time, those teachers are also in Lehigh's College of Education and the special education program and going through coursework there. I also teach at Lehigh the um, instructional design for K-12 educators course. Um, So that connection is nice too, being able to provide that feedback in a formal course setting. That's so cool. What a nice, it sounds like a nice uh, circle. Everything like complements each other and, and works well with Lehigh and Centennial. That's really cool. So you said you have this passion for students with emotional, who require emotional support. What brought you into the field of special education? Did you have an experience uh, before starting um, college, of, before starting a college of education, or is it just something that your heart was drawn to? I would say that I learned about special education in high school. Um, I had an amazing high school music teacher who really showed me what it meant to be a good educator. And through that, um, and him really just teaching me a little bit 
of how to talk to other students and how to meet their needs as a leader within choir, um, that piqued my interest in special education. And originally I had special education as an area of concentration. And then once I started to take the courses, I switched over to being a dual major. So I had elementary and special ed. And in my student teaching, I just saw that there were so many needs that could be met through technology. And I wasn't seeing that there was technology available to the students. Um, So I made it my mission to really be a voice within the field of how can we use technology with students that have emotional and behavioral needs. And as I talked to building leaders, a lot of the comments that I was hearing was like, we we won't give our students expensive technology. Um, That's when I landed upon uh, Centennial School and they were wanting to give students technology. And this is just an amazing, amazing supportive environment. Um, There wasn't a lot of research around using technology with students with special needs, um, specifically emotional and behavioral disorders. But when we looked at the research of what was out there to really help our students, there are three things that stand out. Students with emotional and behavioral disorders respond to direct instruction, choices, and active engagement. And technology helps us to do those three things. So we felt comfortable moving forward in our school-wide system to start to integrate technology in that way. Um, And the more and more we started to introduce technology slowly, we saw that our students responded in such an amazing way. And we went from having a smartphone in every classroom to now we're one-to-one with devices. That is amazing. Now, Sarah, when you're talking about using technology for students with special needs, you are speaking to my heart. I love it. I mean, for me, using technology for um, in the classroom really showed me that a technology can help make the impossible possible for our students with special needs, and it enables them to do amazing things that they may not have been able to do without assistive or adaptive technology or educational technology as a whole that we use um, in the classroom. So it's an amazing resource for every student to use in the class. Definitely. So, Sarah, you talk about, you know, you're, you're a mentor for new teachers. You teach at the college level. Uh, you're a tech guru at your school. How can our students who are preparing to be future special ed teachers, so maybe they're in their freshman, sophomore year of, of col- in their college of education, what do you feel are some best tips to help them prepare and get ready to be a special educator of excellence? I think the first thing is to visit different kinds of classrooms. I don't think that I initially understood how many different categories of classrooms there are. (laughs) Um, It's kind of complicated, but I think it's easy to kind of think that you want one thing and tunnel all of your observation hours into that one kind of classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that student teachers get out there and visit different classrooms Um, so that they can really see what is available and out there and they might surprise themselves. Uh, I think that it's, it's interesting to watch as the teachers that I work with in their first grad class will tell me that they want one thing. And by the time they're student teaching, they're student teaching in a completely different environment (laughs) because they've had those different experiences. I think part of that is really observing with intentionality and not just going in there to put some bullets down on paper so that you can write the observation right up. Really take that deep look at what are the teacher behaviors and how are the students responding and what does active engagement look like? What does the curriculum look like in implementation? How are the support people in the classroom interacting? What kind of environment do you want to be in? And that will help you to really develop what kind of a classroom culture you want to have. It's important that you start to think about those things now early on, because when you hit the ground running with your first classroom, there's so much to think about (laughs) that you want to have all of these tricks in your back pocket. Absolutely. I love how you're sharing about observe with intention and don't just go in there with a blank sheet of paper, like, Hey, I'm ready. Like go in there with a plan, like a plan of attack. I'm going in for these 40 minutes and I'm going to look at grouping. I'm going to look at ed tech. I'm going to look at support uh, people and how they're helping out. I'm looking at classroom environment, looking at curriculum, where the students are going, where they've been and what they're currently doing in the classroom. So go in with a plan, people. That's always, I love that tip. I love it. 
So we're going to kind of bounce around here from all over the uh, College of Education experience here. But whenever we're getting maybe into our sophomore and junior year, we, we've taken that intro to special ed, but intro to special ed course, but we're finding, oh my gosh, special education, there's a lot of acronyms to say the least. So do you have any suggestions to help keep all the acronyms straight or a resource or any tips because there's so many out there and not only understanding what the acronyms stand for, but how they're implemented in practice? Sure. I would say the best way to learn about them and commit them to your memory is to use them. And instead of trying to describe that thing where you put all the needs of the students, it's a legally binding document, <laughs> make yourself say IEP. Yeah. And in order to get yourself to that point of using the acronyms comfortably, you might have to resort to that traditional studying and committing them to memory through flashcards or having a mm -hmm. document. Um, one of the things that I did in my coursework was I had an ongoing document of all of the acronyms. And looked at those on a regular basis. And by the time I got to my student teaching, I was really comfortable speaking to my mentor teacher about the using those acronyms. Mm -hmm. If you haven't committed them to memory by the time you get to your student teaching, you'll probably feel a little bit overwhelmed mm -hmm. because um, the teachers that you're going to be working with are going to be using these acronyms. And their conversations are going to be fast paced because the time you have with them is valuable. So if you're finding that you're in conversations and they say something that you don't know, just keep that ongoing list and then go home, look it up. And if you still don't know it, go back and make sure that you ask that question. I like the idea of having a running document of acronyms. I think that's a fantastic idea. And that's something you can start building as early as freshman year. You can just oh, be yes. a little Google Doc that you have and you just keep adding. And I love the, I also like how you mentioned, if you don't know it, look it up. If you still don't understand it, then ask. And that's so important. We can't just keep going like, oh, I get that. But do you really, do you understand what that acronym means? What does that mean for students' education? You know, really think about how it impacts the student and their educational placement or the accommodations that they're receiving. And part of that is really investing early on in the community that you're going to be doing your student teaching in. It's a great idea to start reading the school board minutes, looking at the curriculum websites, so that when someone says the acronym of whatever curriculum you're using, you know that right away. And that doesn't go to your list of things you need to look up. It's, oh, that's the math curriculum, or oh, that's the reading curriculum. Yes. So knowing those things going into your student teaching placements, and even your observation hours then that becomes a little bit more automatic for you. I, I never heard the tip of reading your school board minutes. I think that's really, that's a really good one. Thanks, Sarah. You're welcome. That was something that was taught to me early on in my student, in my um, observation hours and in my coursework. And I think it really helped me to have a context for what was going on and even knowing the current initiatives that are in the school district that you're working in, it will help you to have that context of what's important in the work that you're doing. It's all important, right? But right. if that school is really committed to reading fluency and all of their work is around the science of reading, you want to know that. You might yeah. be taking an extra course on the science of reading, or you might be reading an extra book so that you're prepared. All of this is about how can you meet the needs of your students, and some of that work takes place outside of your coursework. Absolutely, it does. We know learning happens outside those uh, four walls and even our four, even our virtual walls too. And going beyond what's expected in that in your course or in that classroom, and just going beyond and just helping yourself as a teacher and as a learner, because as we know, learning does not stop at graduation. It does not. <laughs> so I have a question for you. I'm going to relate it to something that you enjoy. So if we were to have special education and we're going to say it's a Sunday, it's some ice cream, and I know you've taken oh, the I Penn State this. course. I know, right? <laughs> the Penn State course of becoming an ice cream maker. I forget what it's called, but it's something very, very impressive. Um, so if we were to add some sprinkles to our ice cream special ed Sunday, how can a special ed major, maybe they're getting into student teaching or they're they're um, 
they're switching placements or maybe they student taught in the fall, how can they add some sprinkles to stand out from, from other uh, special ed candidates for a specific job or stand out during student teaching? I would say documenting your learning is extremely important. Um, and you can do this in a couple of ways. You can take pictures, you can um, document through videos of the work that you're doing. Sometimes that gets tricky, especially in special education, gaining permission from parents and making sure you're following all the rules around right. those things. One of the most critical pieces of my work in student teaching was a journal that we had to keep. And at the time, it kind of felt like, why are we making this journal? Why is this one more <laughs> thing that we have to do? But when I look back on that journal, like I'm I'm a little bit surprised at the level of reflection that I was able to really take on early on in my career, but to be able to make connections of really feeling like, oh gosh, I need to do more to support this student, or I need to be able to implement this lesson in a different way. Having that reflection is going to make you stronger. If you're only focused on writing the lesson plans and implementing the lesson plans and you don't do the actual reflection, you probably won't become a stronger educator mm -hmm. because you're constantly going to be um, really focused on the work that you have to do instead of the needs of your students and really developing them into uh, stronger learners. I love how you mention reflection. Um, in the book, I talk about how reflection saves lives yours and, your, and your students because you're not only reflecting on the lesson planning, delivery, and content and all that stuff, but you're also reflecting on things that happen behind the scenes, the planning, the preparation, the timing, were objectives met. You're also reflecting on classroom environment. Maybe you did some stuff with groupings. Maybe you use some educational technology for instruction. Um, maybe you need to look at some other ways to help support you as an educator with professional development. Um, and these are all things that, that really are kind of maybe behind the scenes. They're not in front of students so much, well, besides the instruction. But um, these are some things that you can really look to to reflect on your own teaching and learning and really have that impact you as an educator of excellence. Absolutely. And the other thing I would recommend is that everyone's going to be going through coursework. So on paper, you're going to look very similar to the other yes. candidates. Very so true. other things that you can do to really separate yourself are take advantage of opportunities that are additional lectures or additional opportunities for you to serve and volunteer in order to show that you're doing other things to gain experiences. Mm -hmm. And not only will it be something to add to your resume, but it will be something that will help you to make decisions about where you want to be. When you finish your degree, you want to have choices about where you work and where you land. And the only way that you're going to be able to do that is if you are a candidate who is extremely strong and has diverse experiences. So you might seek out opportunities to tutor, or you might connect with a local school and help to run an after-school program. Those are connections. Those kinds of connections are what are going to make you a candidate that really stands out. I wish we were on video because my head is nodding and I'm thinking, yes, yes, yes. These are all things, <laughs> absolutely. You wanna stand out because like you said, Everyone takes the same classes. Everyone gets good grades in them. But what makes you different? What makes you a unique candidate? And it's going above and beyond. It's going outside of those um, required courses. It's going to do uh, webinars or going to conferences or being involved in organizations as a future teacher, but in education organizations like PAECT, Kappa Delta Pi, Educators Rising, all these different organizations that can help support and help you grow as an educator. Thank you so much, Sarah. I love that. Um, so I have a question. This one's kind of, it's, it's kind of related. Uh, yeah, we're going to say it's related. So if I have um, a listener out there who is thinking about changing majors into special education, or maybe they just switched over this semester and they added special ed as a dual major or as a minor, what are some suggestions that you have for them to get started in the field of special education? I would say make the most of your summers. And by that, I mean, connect to an organization and make your summer being about exposing yourself to individuals with different abilities and in different environments. It might mean you working at a camp 
It might mean you working at a camp for students with special needs to really give yourself that experience. If you're starting, especially if you're starting not as a freshman, you may have, you may be taking coursework later than your peers. And you might also be in some classes with them that you might have to double up on some classes. So your observation hours, you want to still be meaningful. And in order to make that really meaningful, it will be important that you have some experiences to have a context for what we're talking about when we talk about specially designed instruction and what does it mean to accommodate and modify. If you don't have that context, if you haven't worked with individuals with different abilities, um, then that might be more challenging. So I would suggest to get yourself out there, find a summer job that will give you that opportunity to work with students um, with different abilities. I love that. That's fantastic. So take advantage of your summers, get experiences, and you never know where that's going to lead. It could lead into a new passion area for you. So, for example, whenever I was in college, um, you know, I did lots of different camps for kids with disabilities in the summer. Some of them were um, camps where kids would stay for like a month or maybe it was like just a week long thing. And I remember, you know, having experiences with kids who use communication devices. And there happened to be a camp the next summer um, that was only for kids who use communication devices like Dynavoxes and Toby Max and all that stuff. And it was so cool because I was able to see a different side of a passion area of special education. I was able to really dig deep into this other area. And it was so cool. It was so cool. And it kind of goes back to your sharing about when you're in different field experiences, try to get a variety of experiences of different special education placements. We know there's lots of different um, LREs out there. There's lots of different um, disability categories that you can get experience in and get those and see what is speaking to your teaching heart. Where do you see yourself? Because you might think one thing, you have that experience like, oh, I don't know about that. Or like if you have a variety, you're able to, to really dig deep into an area that's really speaking to your heart. You get to choose where you work and you really have to evaluate what the organization values, especially within special education. You may find that there are organizations that do things that you don't necessarily agree with in relation to physical restraint, um, seclusion. So know that you have to do your homework on that side of things, too. Um, I'm fortunate to work in a space that we are a positive environment, that we support one another, and we use positive practices to speak to our students, but that isn't always the norm. So I think that's also something important for early education majors to really think about is doing your homework and really diving into the mission of the organizations that you want to work with. That was beautiful. I love how you said you have a choice of where you work. And that's so true. It really is. And do your homework, research the school. Yeah, that's excellent. Sarah, this has been so much fun. I really enjoyed chatting about our topic today. Can you share about how my listeners can get in touch with you if they have any questions about Centennial or the Lehigh University program or how they can get in touch with you if they have any questions about using EdTech with students with special needs? You bet the best way will be through Twitter. And my handle is at Sarah Heinzelman, at S-A-R-A-H-E-I-N-T-Z-E-L-M-A-N. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. This has been a blast. And there you have it, Edu Magicians. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. For more edu magic, check out sfesich.com and follow Dr. Sam on Twitter and Instagram at sfesich. Until next time, you have the edu magic within you.